From the Bill of Rights Institute, Fabric of History weaves together U.S. history, founding principles, and what all of this means to us today. Join us as we pull back the curtains of the past to see what's inside. Lawless bandits, high sea adventure, and buried treasure. When we dress up as pirates on Halloween, do our humorous sayings and elaborate costumes bear any resemblance to the real pirates that once terrorized North America? In this episode of Fabric of History, Mary, Kirk, and I, Haley, discuss piracy's rise and fall in the Mediterranean and American colonies, Blackbeard's fierce tactics, pirate havens, and more. Why did so many choose this rough life, and why do we romanticize pirates so much today? Hello, Fabric of History listeners. This is Mary Patterson, and I'm here with Haley Watson and Kirk Higgins. Hey, Haley. Hey, Kirk. Hey, Mary. Hey, Mary. How you doing? I'm freezing, actually, Kirk. I have been freezing since November. I went for a walk yesterday morning before work, and I think I... I was like a popsicle for the rest of the day. I'm I'm just not a winter person. I don't like the cold. I would very much like to be on a beach somewhere in the Caribbean, just taking it easy and getting some sun. That just sounds perfect right about now. <laughs> I was going to say, sounds pretty idyllic. All you need is like uh, maybe a little buried treasure to go along with it. Yeah. So I've, I've actually never been to the Caribbean, but I would love to go because I'm a history dork. And when I think of the Caribbean and you think of pirates, right? Pirates of the Caribbean. And who doesn't love pirates? Who wasn't a pirate for Halloween one year? I think there's always a pirate in my entourage for trick-or-treating. I don't know about you guys, but... I think I was a pirate. Really? Yeah. (laughs) Kirk, were you ever a pirate? You know, I don't think I was, but... I definitely had a bunch of friends who were. It's yeah. one of those images, I think, that, I mean, it's immediately recognizable, too, you know? Yeah, it's a it's a hallmark of Halloween. I think pirates have such a hold on our imagination. And as with anything in the past, like it, there's a really cool story to be told about piracy in North America. So I think that... Exploring that story, where did pirates come from and how did they operate and why do we hold on to their story so much? That sounds like something that's worth a conversation. Piracy is one of those professions, I think, that's been around for a very, very long time. Um, But if we're talking about pirates in the Caribbean or pirates in North America, like where are we in time or what's a good starting point for our tale? When we think about pirates, we think about, or at least that romanticized Halloween version of piracy, we're thinking about a very specific time period. Um, But piracy has been around for a long time. And really, when we're talking about piracy, we're talking about um, essentially the illegal trade of goods in some fashion or another. So it may be uh, stealing things, but for pirates, it's particularly on the high seas, um, taking trade illegally, taking over ships. Um, but that romanticized view, I think, is really thinking about the golden age of piracy, or what people call the golden age of piracy, which is 1650 to 1720s, 1730s. So it's uh, colonial uh, North America, or the colonial period in North America, when European empires are expanding, um, and it's in that expansion that you sort of see the origins of of piracy. You had a lot of conflict going on in Europe uh, that between uh, different factions, and as that content, as that conflict sort of shifts in the 1650s, you see this growth of empires. And with that growth of empires, you're seeing more trade. And with that trade, you're also seeing more ships on the high seas. And so you have sort of all of these individuals who have been involved in that trade in one way or another, or were maybe involved in these different wars in Europe, now turning to illegal trade to try to break out of that system and make money for themselves. Um, This is all exacerbated by things like uh, the system they used to have called Letters of Mark, Letters of Mark were essentially a license uh, for legal piracy. So uh, the 
king or queen of given European nation um, gives you a license, Mary, um, and then you can go out on the high seas and raid that country's enemies, and you get to keep all the spoils of raiding it, but you have sort of the legal protection um, of this other nation. So it's sort of like sanctioned uh, piracy, or I guess maybe today the equivalent would be something like a, a mercenary um, of sorts. Um, so you have these guys that are already sailing around doing that. Uh, the problem is when the war ends, uh, sometimes it's not so much fun to stop doing that. So you have sort of this system that's already in place for these guys going out and attacking um, these different ships, and that becomes sort of the the framework on which this sort of world of pirates gets built. And I think we'll go into that a little bit, but it becomes really interesting how they how how it is that you overcome one of the biggest problems of being a pirate, which is, well, I have a bunch of stuff now. Uh, where do <laughs> I sell it and what do I do with it? And that's not always an easy problem to solve. And it was also their, you know, I mean, they built their quote unquote careers in piracy. And suddenly after like the War of Spanish Secession, now they can't be pirates anymore. They can't do what they've been doing for um, you know, a long time. So it's also a matter of survival in a sense. That's that's for some of them. I'm sure it was all that they knew how to do. All, everyone that they knew was a pirate. They had a crew. You know, you're on a ship somewhere in the Caribbean. You know, what do you do next? Kirk, you situated us in this golden age, like 1650 to 1720. So there's a lot of players in, you know, the Western Hemisphere. You've got Spain, you've got France, you've got England, and they all hate each other. And they're all trying to steal each other's stuff. And they're all plundering all this wealth from North and South America and sending it home. So it's like the perfect situation to go out and steal something. And then all of a sudden, as you guys said, you're out of a job official like a legal job so why would you stop doing what you was okay you know not too long ago but suddenly is considered a crime then you'll be hanged you'll be killed and yeah it's pretty interesting how the tables have turned on these guys i'm not that i'm pro pirate anybody i just think it's interesting to see try to see put yourself in their shoes and understand the choices they made yeah yeah you can't kind of just be like oh actually just kidding i'm sorry i killed all these people and stole all this merchandise i want to go back and join the royal navy and live in london it's kind of like the point of no return in a sense we should mention we're talking a lot about where it is that pirates originated from and sort of how we're romanticizing them. But they were pretty awful. Uh, you know, they're running around the Caribbean. They're stealing property from other individuals. They are famous. Obviously, everyone can think of what they would call the Jolly Roger, which is, you know, their flag. So or the Jolly Roger was one kind, but they would have a flag, typically a black flag that had symbols of death or bones or some sort of uh, skeleton stabbing a heart is another famous one. The idea is to engender fear on whoever it is you're coming up against, but also point to the fact that there's going to be no quarter if you resist. So they're essentially uh, saying, we're going to kill all of you if you try to resist at all. And so brace yourselves for your impending doom. Um, there's a lot of stories of them capturing individuals. Um, pirates often participated you know, in the slave trade. Uh, there are countless examples of them um, just murdering, torturing, doing everything horrific. So by no means is our romanticized version of pirates uh, something that we should overlook, sort of the brutality and terribleness that did occur. That's not to say all pirates either participated in those same kinds of things. There's exceptions when that comes out, but those exceptions are exceptions for a reason. So there may be a moment when they say, oh, this guy didn't just sink and burn this entire ship um, full of people and goods or what have you. Um, but, but it's exceptional, I think, partly because uh, it, it is outside of the norm. Charles Vane was a notoriously cruel pirate out of the bunch, even, even out of a bunch of pirates. He was worse than most of them. <laughs> um, but he was known for keel hauling, which involved tying someone to a rope and then dragging that person underwater from one end of the ship to another. Um, and this usually resulted in drowning. Or you could also die from just head trauma of just being dragged you know along the bottom of this ship so this was if you were captured by a pirate you know you better better be um hoping that i mean you really don't have any hope you know it's <laughs> <laughs> probably won't go well for you it was yeah a very vicious time these guys, although there was a period when there was longer voyages taking place um it's typically called the pirate round where you had pirates going overseas 
and raiding off the coast of of Africa um, and particularly around to like Madagascar into the Indian Ocean. Um, there's a very famous story of Henry Avery, um, who, you know, captured one of the Mughal um, – mogul emperor's galleons and made him very rich um his story is really interesting but that's off the coast of india so you do have this sort of huge expanse that these guys are are sailing around and raiding different trade but the caribbean becomes a, a hangout particularly jamaica because it's sort of situated in an area where you can go on shorter expeditions there's a lot of trade coming from the americas going towards europe um, the a lot of those ships are sort of concentrating there because even though you have this vast ocean there are certain areas in the ocean where ships just tend to go because it's like, if you think about it like a highway, you can catch a current and it's a lot easier to get from point A to point B, or you can do it in the least amount of time and doing it in the least amount of time becomes really important in the age of sail because you, you know, don't have a lot of food and water stored on your ship. And that's really all you have. So you can find these areas where this trade is more concentrated. And that means that the pirates are going to hang out there because they can raid that trade. So the Gulf Stream obviously goes up the coast of North America. That's one of the things that they were um, really prowling around and, and taking advantage of. Um, but also because in that area of the Caribbean, there's a lot of short day sails where you can get more supplies and get more nutrients. You don't have to be out at sea you know, for months at a time without seeing land. Um, so it's sort of a, a nice area um, for that reason as well. Um, and Jamaica is interesting because of the city of Port Royal. Uh, there was an earthquake in the 1690s, um, and it basically sank the city into the sea. And this was seen sort of across um, the the continent as like this, you know, retaliation from God saying like these pirates are committing evil in this town. It's just full of, you know, it's like a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah kind of a story. I mean, the city literally sank into the ocean um, and and it was a horrific event, um, but it was seen as like this moment and it's written about throughout the North American continent. So that kind of points to um, just how well known these pirates were at the time and how how well known their their adventures and things were at the time as well. So the Caribbean, I mean, in addition to all of these things, you have all these, you know, coming and going, it's a highway in this time period, but you know, you have the deep ports. So it's very practical or right? you can get your water and things like that. And it's also a re really nice weather. Like if you're thinking about, if we're just talking about, you know, British colonies, because we come, we, the United States come from a British, part of the British empire. I mean, and you, like you said before, Haley, you could just, you know, stop, you know, raiding ships and move to England. If I have the choice of living in London or living in Jamaica, even though there is a threat of this hurricane, I'm going to stay there. I mean, life in London, I think life throughout Europe is... What was it poor, nasty, brutish, and short at this time period? That's what Thomas Hobbes says in um, Leviathan in like, 1651. So it's not, I mean, everyday life is pretty hard and probably very tedious, but to be a pirate or to be like on these ships and seeing these places and, you know, sounds exciting. Again, pro pirate. Now I am the pro pirate voice in this conversation. No, yeah, I, I can see that too. And I was reading a bit about just how bad it was back in England, and England was where a lot of these pirates were from. But just the conditions, you know, if you were not well off, I think a lot of the origin stories, especially since there weren't many records except for, you know, legal records, records of plunder. But, but besides that, you know, there really weren't many records of when a pirate was born or, or things like that. But they, a lot of them were traced back to originating in, in England. But if you weren't well off, you really had a, a tough time. There were there was a lot of homelessness, a lot of homeless children roaming around the bad parts of England. Um, you know, watching executions was part of everyday life. There were a lot of diseases. And I can see in a sense why people gravitated towards sailing. But again, like joining the Navy or a merchant ship didn't sound that great. Um, they weren't paid well. You would be conscripted really any time, even if you were done with a mission, you were just kind of hanging out in a bar back in town. These groups of sailors could come and get you. It's called pressing, I believe, groups of pressers, but they would literally come and take these seamen from from a bar, from a restaurant in, in England back to sea. So this was the legal way to do things, the legal way to sail. So you can kind of see why being a pirate, being quote unquote free, appealed. And they had it seemed to have a fairer division of plunder among the crew 
and the captain. So it, it seemed to be a little bit fairer that way. I want to say, I don't be like too, I don't know, respectful of the pirates. But yeah, I guess I'm mainly saying that if you were in the Navy or a merchant, there were problems when you came back from a voyage about getting paid. Um, and that was a common grievance among those legal sea people. And it was probably more immediate gratification that when you plunder a large ship, you see the treasure, you take the treasure, you know, it's it's yours. You don't have to wait for a, a government um, to decide to pay you back home. It's very entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, again, like I think, well, at least, like the example I'm thinking of is William Kidd, who was a famous English mm -hmm. pirate who starts as a privateer. Right? He is sanctioned by powerful politicians in England to go out and plunder other people's ships. And then he becomes a pirate, right? Like the death, suddenly he was doing the exact same thing, but now his label has changed and he's, he ends up being executed. But it's that line between um doing things the quote unquote right way and then being a pirate and i think that's that's very interesting yeah i think i think you're touching on some of the things that make that that we begin to look to pirates as like this romantic sort of in the the older sense of that word this rom these romantic figures because they are you know they're living this free more free lifestyle um they're sort of only beholden to people who they're directly giving assent to follow um they have these opportunities to get great riches you know from these different expeditions um and yeah i mean life on pirate ships wasn't any nicer than it was you know in the royal navy where yeah disease was was rampant you know lots of people getting scurvy which you know develops from a lack of you know vitamins from citrus mm -hmm. fruit um they're eating salted beef what they call the navy salt horse which is just like rock hard you know pieces of beef um they would get you know sort of stale moldy bread when they were in harbor and then they would get biscuits when they were out further out at sea and these biscuits had to last for months so they were also rock hard they would often have weevils in them so you'd have like you know actual living like little maggots and things <laughs> in your food so it's it's miserable right um and it's not like living as a pirate was better than that but you i think there was this idea this sort of romance mm -hmm. um of of what it meant to get away from that lifestyle and to actually directly profit from the actions that you were taking and it's interesting too you know especially in north america you had at this time, so starting in 1650s, but then up and through um, like the late 1690s, the growth of sort of the apparatus for maintaining the what became the British Empire, but was really England at the beginning, um, is forming. And so you had these navigation acts that are starting to create the mercantilist system that existed sort of, you know, in um, North America. And so you have these colonial governors and these colonial um, governments who are frustrated with their inability to trade whatever they want because they're in this sort of imperial system. Um, and so they actually are incentivized to sort of help out these pirates or that the pirates are actually benefiting them in some way and acting as smugglers and everything else. Um, so you have this sort of whole system that's set up where it starts to look like, yeah, it's freedom versus tyranny in this sort of big way. Yeah. And kind of going back to how these – colonies, not yet America, but how the um, the colonies in North America viewed the pirates. Uh, Puritan Boston was actually very, you know, welcoming to pirates because they brought goods that were not easily accessible otherwise. It was referred to as the common receptacle of pirates of all nations by John Winthrop in 1646. And yeah, surprisingly, pirates supplied these colonies with coins that they weren't always able to get that they could then pay the English with to buy goods. So they really, in a sense, you could argue that they they had to, you know, trade with the pirates a little bit to at least get coins so they could then buy things because a lot of things just were not available in the colonies. Yeah. So I think if, if we could, I'd be interested in getting into that a little bit because I think sometimes we forget you know we always think about these you know the aptly named movie that came out a few years ago parts of the caribbean we always think about the pirates down the caribbean um but there's a lot of stories of piracy on the shores of north america maybe we could talk about a couple of those stories so the the pirate that 
I know of, and I don't know when I first heard of him, but I think Blackbeard or Edmund Teach is a very is one of the more well known um, North American pirates, and he is based in North Carolina. So what's what's his story, or how does he? Why is he so legendary? Yeah, so he's legendary for he's legendary for a lot of reasons, um, but but mainly because he does have this great nickname, Blackbeard, um, and uh, yeah, he was he was eventually his ship was sunk off um, the coast of North Carolina. It was the Queen Anne's Revenge, uh, which is a very fun name for a ship, um, and he was known for. Uh, you know, like really dolling himself up to to get into the minds of the people that he was attacking. Um, so he would do things like he would put slow match in his beard. And slow match was, you know, at the time you have cannons that were lit by a fuse as opposed to just um, like later there would be a flintlock or something else. But they had this slow match that would be used to sort of touch the top of a cannon and would light the powder off and fire it off. And so it was this slow burning you know, fuse essentially. And he would put those in his beard. So it looked like he was like smoking like this wow. demon um, who was coming on board your ship. Um, and so he's just notorious for that and for being, for being very barbarous and just being sort of an overall not nice guy. Um, and he had sailed around with a few other pirates um, that are also well known. So Benjamin Horn Hornigold is one um, and Samuel Bellamy is another. So he was raiding up the coast. He has this sort of, uh, bounty on his head um he had been basically they would sail into these ports occasionally and they would basically get the colonial governments to pay them money to go away which is you know a great protection racket as we tend to think of it now um kind of like the mafia you know used to do um so they would sail off but finally um you know the governor of virginia alexander spotswood said enough of this um offers a bribe and ends up um getting attacked and killed in ocracoke inlet um in 1718 and dies this sort of brutal death um he was you know shot a whole bunch of times and had like over 20 sword cuts and and it was pretty gruesome but they ended up decapitating him and putting his head up on um the bow of the ship so when it was sailing in he could be seen as you know having been defeated which is a whole a whole other side tangent we could get into with uh, sort of the way that they would do at Execution Dock in London. They used to hang people in um, gibbets or gibbets. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but they would basically put the bodies, they would tar the bodies and then hang them in these cages, essentially, as a warning to people not to commit acts of piracy. And they would just like hang them up there for like days and months at a time, which is pretty horrific. I think you you see that in um, in the movie, The Pirates of the Caribbean, when they sail in, they think that they like take, I don't know if it's a Captain Jack Sparrow, the Johnny Depp character or someone else, but they take their hat off because they're like, oh, fallen comrades or something, all these pirates that have been captured. And it was trying to deter other people from pursuing an an act of piracy but i think that points to the larger uh, idea like this time life is really brutal like nasty brutus and short like it was very common even in the pilgrims you know colony in plymouth to put heads on spikes to say don't do this or this will happen to you and that to us sounds like absolutely abhorrent and grotesque but that's common. You could, you know, so the pirates are brutal, but I think a lot of things about life in this time were very dog eat dog and brutal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to note that pirates served as inspiration to other pirates, you know, during that time. And it seems like a lot of pirates from the golden age, quote unquote, of piracy, like Blackbeard, Samuel Bellamy and others looked up to Henry Avery, who came a little bit before them. But he was respected, especially because he was never caught. Um, <laughs> he, did, he had a very short career of about two years. And just two years, he captured roughly a dozen vessels and made off with tens of millions of dollars in booty. And he went all over. He had that big capture of the mogul ship. But after that, he escaped to Ireland and was never seen or heard from again. And funny note, he took someone's wife. I forget who it was. I think it was some kind of governor there. But the wife ran away with him and they were never seen again. I so, that. yeah, that but that kind of served as inspiration for later pirates. You know, this guy did what he had to do, took, took lots of money from people and got away with it. And that, I think more than anything, served as inspiration for these later pirates. You know, if you see someone's head on a pike, I think that does that does influence you a certain way, you know, but it's interesting that these powers, the English powers felt 
that they had to do this, that that piracy was such a problem that they needed to deter others from becoming pirates. Yeah, I think seeing sort of that vast wealth that can be accumulated quickly Mm -hmm. is such a powerful thing. It reminds me another story off the coast of North America, the the wreck of the treasure fleet um, in 1715, wreck of the treasure fleet um, in the Urca de Lima galleon, um, which was, you know, one of these where this unimaginable wealth, I mean, it, I think it can't be overstated how little people subsisted on in how much wealth this represented. I mean, lifetimes and lifetimes of wealth sitting in some of these trading ships. And then it goes down off the coast of Florida, uh, and the pirates just showed up and attacked the Spanish who were trying to recover it from the ocean, uh, and again became these just, you know, famously rich figures, uh, you know, not necessarily the career that you would want to go into for the long term, but it's just, you can see why stories like that were inspiring to these individuals who are wanting to go out and make money and in some cases, just continue to fight sort of against their common enemies anyway. So Benjamin Hornigold, who was a part of that, uh, you know, raid on the, the Urca de Lima Galleon, would only attack English ships and like, or would only attack the enemies of England, excuse me. So he would only attack the enemies of England because that's kind of how he got his start. And so he saw himself in a certain way, obviously operating illegally. Um, but that's that blurred line that you were talking about, Mary, like, so one day he's doing it and he's attacking the Spanish and that's okay. And then some document gets signed and it's not okay anymore. And so he's just supposed to stop. Mm-hmm. And man, it sounds like I'm apologizing for Benjamin Hornigold. I, I promise I'm not. <laughs> um, but this it's whole at least podcast is apologizing. <laughs> for pirates. Yeah, you can at least see that you can at least see the blurred lines there, right? Like it gets, you know, it, it you can see where it is that these guys made a choice to say, nope, I'm going to keep doing this and I'm going to make a profit off of it. I think that's part of the reason why the idea of pirates resonates still today is the idea that um, just the idea of the treasure, right? And you could stumble across treasure. I think that's, that's part of the appeal for sure. Like I know I have been to the treasure coast of Florida, which is it's named that because of the, the Urca de Lima. And there are still people today um, myself included, who go to Vero Beach in Florida and are looking to find a piece of this treasure. And it's really like the best time to go is after a storm because the water has been churned up and you'll see people with metal detectors. I don't have a metal detector, but that is one of my dreams in life is to get one so I can comb the beaches of the Treasure Coast and find, I don't actually want to find like a gold, a coin or something. I want to find a jewel. That's really what I want to find. But um, but people have done it, and there are museums. There's a I think it's called Mel Fisher's Treasure Museum. We can maybe link to it or include it in our show notes. Or this man, these treasure hunters, find like die for the treasure, and he act. He's in court with the state of Florida for a long time, but he ends up having the exclu- He owns what he found, and it's like gold bars, massive chains with giant jewels. I mean, the stuff, when you think treasure, this is real treasure. So um, yeah, like you're saying, Kirk, the the opportunity to become wealthy and to escape this sort of humdrum, tough, short, everyday life is is pretty alluring. And I think people today, right, we're still trying to find that, myself included, find my, you know, Spanish doubloons or something washing up on the beach. I think that's right, Mary. I think there's something powerful about it. And you see you know, even into the 19th and 20th century, sort of this this idealized view of pirates, right? So you think about like the early movies with like Errol Flynn and uh, the movie Captain Blood. It's like this swashbuckling adventure, but it's really sort of escapism, right? Or it's thinking about this idealized view of freedom and making your own choices and getting rich in the process and then, you know, living this wonderful life in the middle of the warm Caribbean. Um, you think about the, the book Treasure Island, you know, by Robert Louis Stevenson written um, in the 1880s. And it's the same kind of thing. You know, it's this adventure. It's this escape. It's this journey to find yourself. But there's this romance, again, that older view of romance, like sort of this idealized view where every day on the high seas is this tranquil, sunny, warm day with a soft breeze, and you're sailing around (laughs) with all your best friends. And yeah, occasionally you'll 
Yeah, mm-hmm. you'll you'll occasionally steal a ship and and make a bunch of money and and then that'll be it. And then you get to, you know, go back and sit on the beach and, you know, drink a bunch of rum or something. I don't know. But uh but it's you can see where that becomes this appealing sort of stylized version of what, you know, was sort of born out of economic conditions and in the realities difficult realities that individuals were facing so the golden age of piracy did end if anyone hasn't noticed we don't have pirates running around the caribbean and cape cod and north carolina like we did but it 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 ended there are many reasons why but an interesting one that i found woods rogers um started out as a privateer and he was sponsored by Bristol merchants whose ships had been lost to foreign privateers. Um, he actually, side note, rescued someone named Alexander Selkirk, um, who was a Scottish seaman whose adventures later provided the basis for Robinson Crusoe. He was stranded on a Pacific island uh, for about four years and learned how to live with a bunch of goats. I believe that was kind of <laughs> what he was doing. But his his adventures later fueled that amazing book by Defoe. But he landed in Nassau, uh, the Hamas, and this was a huge pirate hub. It was a headquarters of about 2,000 pirates. And he was largely responsible for kind of turning this free piracy around and setting up government. He became governor of the Bahamas there. And he basically told them, you know, we're going to turn a blind eye to everything that you've done if you become good citizens and settle down and, you know, try to make this a an honest island. So a lot of pirates did accept this offer. No one wanted to go to jail or get executed. Um, but some other ones just refused this. I believe Benjamin Hornigold was one of the pirates who accepted this offer. So Hornigold actually ended up hunting down Charles Vane, another noted pirate. So, you know, not all pirates were were equal at that time. There were definitely fused within the piracy and, and what, you know, what they decided to do with this new policy. So that that fueled this end to this you know, mass piracy, um, but also just the expansion of the British Navy to create a more stable world order in general you know, not being bogged down by so many wars. So they were able to create a a bigger army and just really clamp down on all this crazy piracy happening in North America. Yeah, for sure. To put on my civics educator hat for a second, uh, you can see as these empires are better able to project their power into North America, that this opportunity for lawlessness, call it, diminishes. So you begin to see sort of the the growth of stronger colonial governments, the growth of the ability for these empires to mitigate against the losses due to piracy. And that's reflected not only in the Caribbean, but also in North America, as you see sort of stronger uh, control in the colonies of, you know, the British, for example, um, exerting more direct control of the colonies. Obviously, we know where that story goes in 1776. But, um, you know, there, there's a there's a link to the, the pirates there as well. You know, the, the pirates aren't exempt from feeling the growth of that imperial uh, projection of power. Even as the, you know, the heyday of the pirates and, you know, the black beards and the, you know, all the people we've talked about goes away. I mean, piracy still continues, right? And there's still, so there's still outright piracy, right? As long as there's something worth stealing, there's going to be piracy in some form. And privateering will continue, which is sort of that blurred line of you know, basically kind of doing what pirates do, but it being okay. And even like in, you know, the early United States as a, as its own, you know, sovereign nation has to deal with the Barbary pirates. So it's not like piracy goes away at all. But um, but Blackbeards and the Benjamin Hornigolds, we don't see characters like that as much, but we still have them for Halloween costumes. And they're still, I think they're still so much a part of our, you know, they're a part of our, our culture. For better or worse. Yeah. Because I think when you, when you step back from it, it, yeah, you can romanticize it. Once you get down to reading these stories of pirates and just awfulness, um, bloodthirstiness. Literally, yeah, it's it's not so cute, but it's it's hard. Yeah, it's it's very hard to separate you know that big picture idea of them from you know what actually happened. 
I think using our using our interest in pirates and why why they endure, why they're so interesting to us is a good like like we just did in our conversation, Kirk and Haley, is to to probe a little bit deeper. And that's all that's what we're all about here at the Bill of Rights Institute is trying to to tell those stories and explore them and look for nuance. So there's definitely, you know, the pirates of the Caribbean image of what piracy is. And then there's a very more real kind of nasty side to it as well. And I think taken together, um, when you look at all the pieces of the puzzle is when you start to get a better um, picture of what it was and why it was that way and how it is part of the fabric of our history. Ooh, I love that. Kirk, (laughs) Haley, thank you so much for talking pirates with me. We got through this without one R. So I think that's, I got one in there. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha ha. So I think we should, I mean, throw it out to our listeners. So what are your, like, were you a pirate for Halloween? Why, what resonates with you or does it resonate with you when we talk about piracy and this, you know, the age of Blackbeard and all of these, these great stories that really endure. So reach out to us. You can always write to us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. You can find us on all the social media channels. If you like listening to us, please give us a review that helps, you know, us reach more people and hear more stories and tell more stories. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you think of us. And until next time, everybody, keep asking questions. The Bill of Rights Institute engages, educates, and empowers individuals with a passion for the freedom and opportunity that exist in a free society. Check out our educational resources and programs on our website, mybri.org. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes? We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to stay connected and informed about future episodes. Thank you for listening.